Well, hello, I'm Jerry Dearman. Welcome to the Solid Lives Weekly Message, and I have a good message for you today. But first, let me say thank you to all of you who have been partnering with us, either through tithing or giving, and especially those of you who have given above and beyond to give toward the Jesus Disciple Fund. You know, we were working really, I'd say, three years, but we didn't realize we were working on it for three years to develop a whole new discipleship system beyond Operation Solid Lives, which we've used for 20 years, and it's gone to nations all over the world. But now this new discipleship system called Jesus Disciple, this is superior because not only does it impact people through gathering them together and saturating them with the Word of God, but this also trains every disciple to be a disciple maker. And this is what Jesus intended, is that every believer is a disciple maker. Follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men, not just a disciple. And so we're excited because September the 15th, 2023, we launched this brand new system. And this is, I believe, gonna go until Jesus comes. And it's gonna go all over the world. It's already in other nations. Uh, already within two months, we have about 10 networks. Different ministries can set up a network in Jesus Disciples so that they can have their own downlines of discipleship groups multiplying, house churches multiplying, and such. So we had this initial goal of raising $500,000 to bring Jesus Disciple into five languages and 10 nations in one year. And praise God, we're already up to over 480 thousand dollars toward the or no four hundred twenty three thousand excuse me toward the five hundred thousand so we just got a little over seventy five thousand dollars to go so thank you so much to all of you who have been sewing into this and I'll tell you this we launched it in English and Spanish but we're almost done translating territory one in Arabic can you believe that this is going to go to the Middle East where all this conflict has been happening discipleship is going to go there through the Jesus Disciple system. So we're thrilled about this. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your giving and your partnership because we really appreciate it. Okay, now this message today is, it's a different message. I felt led of the Lord that we have to open up our Bibles and look at some of the key factors regarding this whole Israel, Hamas, conflict that's happening in the Middle East and these these demonstrations that are happening around the world where people are saying from the river to the sea. And I want to talk about what that means, but I want to take it from the scriptures. This is not a political message. We don't have time. I don't have time for politics, but I do have time for what God is doing in the earth and to combat what the enemy is doing in the earth. So This is not about politics to us. This is not about physical battles to us. It's about bringing the love of Jesus and the gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone in the world. And the Bible says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God to salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So God wants his people, Israel, to be saved. But God also wants everyone else, the Palestinians and the Arabs and the Muslims and the people in Italy and the people in all the African countries, et cetera, et cetera. God wants everybody to be saved. So we're not against people. We're for people being saved. And this is what this message is about. But we have to understand what the Bible says and where God stands in these things so that we can pray correctly, think correctly, talk correctly, answer with wisdom. And it all starts with the knowledge of God coming from the scriptures. And so I believe you're going to enjoy this. This may be a message that uh, you want to send a, another open-hearted person that really wants to learn and be more clear about these things from the Bible. I wouldn't use it <laughs> to send to people that are antagonistic or against these things, but to enlighten people who are open. And so anyway, grab your Bible, open up your heart to receive. This message is called Covenant Eyes, and I think you're really going to be stirred by it. Let's watch this. 1 Timothy chapter 2. This is going to be a different kind of a message today, but I believe you'll see quickly that it is an important one. 1 Timothy chapter 2, and I want to talk about Covenant Eyes. Now, there's a software, Covenant Eyes, that uh, watches over what people watch on the internet and gives them accountability. It's a great great system. 
for people who have uh, struggled with uh, porn and those kind of things. Uh, but I want to talk about covenant eyes from this perspective, that we need to have eyes that see the covenants of God in the earth and how they're playing out before our very eyes. Because if you don't see that, you'll be caught up in the rhetoric, the political rhetoric, what's happening in our world, and you'll jump on one uh, viewpoint or perspective or another and not realize that you are completely violating covenant. We need to understand the covenants. We need to understand God's plan in the earth and get into alignment with God's plan, not just with a certain political party's plan. But we need to get into alignment with God's plan. And so I'm going to show you this today and I want to begin from 1 Timothy chapter 2. And let's do this. Let's read the first five verses out loud together. 1 Timothy chapter 2. I just looked down and saw that I'm in 2 Timothy and that would not go well. So let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, and uh, we'll read from the New King James Version. If you don't have that version, that's all right, but follow along on the screens if you would so we could all read the same words. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 5, reading loudly and together. Let's read. Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Now look again at the first verse. Paul says here, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this is really the Holy Spirit saying this to us, Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for who? For all men. Does God care about every human being on the planet? Yes. Oh, yes, he does. There is not one little person in one obscure place in the planet that God does not care about. Every human being was made in the image and likeness of God, and God loves them. And God wants them to know him and to be in his family and to be in relationship with him. God loves them. And here in this passage, the Bible says, therefore, I exhort that you pray for everybody. Don't leave anybody out. Isn't that right? Pray for every, everybody, for kings and everybody. But notice here in verse 3, it says, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who, verse 4, desires all men, everybody, to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God desires, why do we need to pray? Because God desires everybody to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. You don't know the truth until somebody brings it to you. The world doesn't have the truth. The world has opinions and perspectives that may seem right. You know, professionals and experts and professors and such that come out so eloquently and make their points and their case. And you could be... You could be pulled into understanding and believing with believing what they say. But notice here, God has a perspective, and it's the right perspective. It's the accurate perspective, and it's called the truth. And the Bible says God desires all men to be saved and to come, come from their perspective over to the knowledge of the truth. Can you see this? So they may be intelligent, educated, smart, well-read, etc., but they still have to come from that limited perspective over to the knowledge of the truth. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Amen. And it also says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So you haven't even begun to have knowledge of the truth until you fear God. Until you fear God and you know that he is God, and that what his word says is true, you have not begun, begun to know anything because you're already on the wrong path. You're, you already have the wrong premise. But once you come to know God and you come over to the knowledge of the truth, now you can begin to see with open eyes reality and how things are really working. And this is what I want to bring to you today. I'm going to bring to you a perspective that you will not hear from the news. You will not hear from all of the social media and what's going on. You will hear very little. And even from believers, you'll hear a limited view of this. 
But I want to give you a biblical perspective today. I want you to see through covenant eyes. So God desires, look again at verse 4, all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. And who is that mediator? Notice, the man. He's still a man. He became a man. God became a man. And the man, Christ Jesus, is the only way to salvation. And this is what it's all about. So we're going to pray today over the hostages that they be released. We're going to pray, yes, for Israel. But notice this passage says pray for everybody because God desires everybody to be saved. God has a plan and a heart, and God is actively pursuing every human being on the planet that before they die or before the end of the age, that they would be saved and come over to the knowledge of the truth. And the enemy is against this plan. But God is actively working in this plan. So don't ever think that God is against people. God is for everybody. They may turn against him, and they'll suffer a consequence if they don't switch positions. But God is not against them. He is for them. He loves them. And he has gone to great lengths, more than any other being in the universe, to save every human being. And he even told us to go get them and to go make disciples. Isn't that right? So we're a part of this whole plan. All right, now, so we're going to pray here as we close this out. But I want to say that I don't have a political message today. We want to talk about what's going on here with the whole Israel war and all that was spread across the whole world. This has captivated the world, and for good reason. But I don't have a political message. I have a spiritual message. This conflict cannot be solved politically. The Bible says it cannot be solved politically because it is really a spiritual conflict. And if you don't understand that, you're going to be talking on a human level and not talking with any real wisdom or knowledge. You have to understand this is spiritual. And I want us to open up, if you have your Bible, to the book of Revelation. You might say, why are we going to Revelation? Because, folks... We're at the end of the age. I don't know how close we are. I'm not calling any dates, but I know we're at the end of the age. Here's one way I know, because 2,000 years ago in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, Peter stood up and said, what's happening right now is what Joel prophesied. He said, in the last days, I'm going to pour out my spirit. Well, if the last days were 2,000 years ago, how many of you know we must be in the last of the last days today? <laughs> Isn't that true? And so we know that. But not only that, we also know the signs of the times. The Bible told us how these prophecies would play out. And we're watching a scenario happen that could very well play right into the tribulation period. We don't know that for sure, but it's possible. Things have lined up in such a way, and the world is on fire with this issue in such a way that I've never seen in my lifetime. Okay, now, Revelation chapter 4. Listen to this. Let's just read this one verse. John, the, the person who this was revealed to, the, the book of Revelation is the, not revelations, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus was revealed to him, and the end times were revealed. So notice this, after these things, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. Not may take place. This is the way it's going to happen. That must take place after this. Okay, now I'm going to skip to chapter 12 because I'm going to walk you through Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 is an overview of what's happening today. It's been happening throughout history, but it's, we're in it today. We're still in, you're in Revelation chapter 12. I'm going to show you where you are. You are in Revelation chapter 12. You are named in Revelation chapter 12. Let me show you. Revelation 12, 1. Let's start there. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman. Everybody say a woman. A woman, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. So we have to identify who is this woman. There are so many allegories in the book of Revelation that sometimes people read it and they think, well, I can't, I can't understand that. And if you say that, you probably won't understand much. But if you, if you instead say, Holy Spirit, you inspired this, and you're inside of me, 
So bring light and understanding to me. So let's talk about who is this woman. Does anybody remember the man Joseph, one of the 12 sons of Jacob? And when he was young, 17 years old, he had these dreams and he shared with his brothers and they were already mad at him because he was dad's favorite and they got more mad at the dreams. Does anybody remember the second dream? Listen to the second dream in Genesis 37, 9. It says, then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon and 11 stars bowed down to me. The sun and the moon are Jacob and Rachel, his parents. And God changed Jacob's name to what? To Israel. And the 11 stars that bowed down to him are his 11 brothers, and Joseph himself is the 12th star. These are the 12 stars. They are the 12 sons of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. These are the 12 sons and the 12 tribes of Israel. And notice this woman, has she's clothed with the sun, she has the moon under her feet, and she's got this garland of 12 stars around her. The Bible is identifying this woman as the nation of Israel, the Jewish nation of Israel. Now, where did this woman come from? Let me read to you from Genesis 12. Genesis 12, verse 1, this is the beginning of the Jewish nation. You need to know the Jewish nation did not exist. It was not some people that came from Noah's family, you know, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, you know, and they they split up, and that's how the Jewish nation came about, through that breakdown in family tree. No, that's not how it started. The Jewish nation would never have existed without God. Listen, let me show you the beginning of the Jewish nation. Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house. I want you to listen to the words. To a land. The first thing God said to Abraham is, I need you to leave your land, and I want you to go to another land. This is not a land that you've ever been to, Abram. This is not a land that you chose or would choose. Out of all the earth, this is the land, a land that I chose, and I want you to leave your land, and I want you to go to this land because I have a plan of something I want to do on that land. Leave your nation and go to a land that I will show you. Verse 2, I will make you a great nation. You're not right now. You're just a man. And you don't even have children because your wife is barren. But I'm going to make you a great nation. Where? On that land. Is anybody seeing this? Whose idea is this? Is this Abraham's idea? No. Was this just something that happened biologically? No. This is something that was in the heart of God. And God came and spoke it to Abram and said, This is what I want to do with you. Leave, go to a land, and I'm going to make you a great nation in that land. Now watch this. He goes on to say, I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Now watch verse 3. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. You need to watch what you say about that nation and that land. It has nothing to do with politics. It has nothing to do with what's happening on the ground right now. This dates back 4,000 years to God saying, I want to do something. And notice what the purpose is. He said, I'll bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And, Abram, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Because this is my plan. My plan is to send you to a land and to take that land and make a great nation from that land. And from that land, a Savior is going to come who saves the entire world. Can you see this? This is the plan. This is the plan. Look at verse 7. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. That's God saying it. That's not, well, who should have it? Who won it? Well, what's, what's the situation on the ground and such? No, we have to look at all those areas. We, God loves everybody. 
He wants to help everybody, every suffering family, everybody hurting, everybody that is, that is dying of starvation or anybody who is under siege or being attacked or vulnerable. God loves them. He wants to help them. This is not God being against anybody. This is God wanting to save the entire world. But God said, this is the way I want to do it. I want to do it by sending you to a land and making a nation in that land. And from that nation, I want to save everybody. This is his plan. And it's a good plan. Yeah. However, there's a problem with this plan. And let's go back to Revelation chapter 12. We made it through one verse. <laughs> now, listen, if you can listen more quickly, I'd appreciate it. Revelation 12, look at verse 2. Now, well, let me just say, the woman. So we, we talked about the woman with the garland of 12 stars and the sun and the moon. Who is the woman? The woman is the Jewish nation of Israel that God started. This is the woman that we're talking about. Verse 2, then being with child. Oh, she's pregnant. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. These are kings and leaders of nations. And seven diadems on his head. Verse 4, his tail drew a third of the stars. Let me interpret that for you. Angels, a third of the angels in heaven influenced a third of the angels to rebel against God. His tail drew a third of the stars in heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth, trying to stop this child from being born. Capital C child in the New King James Version, because this is talking about Jesus. Jesus came from God's plan of putting a creating a new nation, putting them in a new land. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, which is in the south of that land, and he was raised in Nazareth, which is in the north of that land. This is how the Savior came to the world, in that land through that nation. And notice, the red dragon wants to stop this, did not want this child to be born, did not want this Savior to come to the world. And if you remember when Jesus was born... King Herod the Great sent out trying to kill him and slaughtered infant babies trying to kill him. But God had warned Joseph in a dream to flee to Egypt with the child. Do you remember the story? Okay, this is all part of the plan that's playing out. So notice here it says, verse 5, She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God. So notice this is a major, uh, a lengthy timeline. Caught up to God, ascended back and everything. So the child was here briefly and then ascended to God. That's what happened. He was here for 33 years out of history, and then he's, he's out. He's ascended. Okay. Now, listen to Galatians 3.16. It says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, And to seeds as of many, but as to one, and to your seed who is Christ. Can you see that? So this is through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. Out of the son or the tribe of Judah comes Jesus, who is born of this woman. The way that Jesus got to the earth to save us is through this nation, the Jewish people, and from that land that God gave them. Are you seeing this? This is all in play right now. Now watch this. Revelation 12, verse 6 now. Then the woman fled into the wilderness. This is after the birth, after Jesus came. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where a place was prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days, 42 months, three and a half years. Ring a bell? Half of seven years of a tribulation period. This is the real tribulation, three and a half years. This whole scenario is going to culminate with this. The Jewish people and this major attack from a great red dragon coming, trying to destroy this woman even after the Messiah came, trying to destroy this woman. And it's going to culminate with a three and a half year period. So notice this now. It says, verse 7, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. So notice 
Heaven is against the dragon, and the dragon is against heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, and now here's the identification of who this dragon is. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan. What does that mean, serpent of old? This goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 when the serpent shows up in the Garden of Eden. That serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. I mean, just pegged him. This is the dragon. And this dragon, Satan himself, is at war with the woman. He hates the woman. The nation that God started, he detests it with everything in him. And he wanted to destroy the nation before she gave birth. He wanted to destroy the child when he was born. And he wants to destroy this woman. Now the child's in heaven, but he wants to destroy this woman now on the earth. This is a war. This is what the Bible tells us is happening in the, in the world, in the spiritual realm. And then notice this. It says, who deceives the whole world. He's called the devil and Satan who deceives how many people? He does not have a small following. He is deceiving the entire world. The entire world, he's getting them to view this whole situation with his perspective, from his points of view, giving them information so that they begin to champion what he wants them to say. He deceives the whole world all to destroy this nation, this woman that God began To bring salvation to the world, he wants to destroy it. So notice this, verse 10. Well, who deceives the whole world, verse 9, he was cast to the earth. That's the question I have when I get to heaven, like, there are many planets. Why did you cast him here, right? (laughs) Is that right? Hey, come on, amen, anybody? (laughs) We don't want him either, you know? Okay. And his angels were cast out with him, okay? Verse 10, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, Messiah, have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him. This is how we overcome him. By the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Because for many it will come to that. Will you give up your faith in Jesus even if it means death? They did not love their lives to the death. And notice this. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. And the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath. Why? Because he knows he has a short time. And this is what we're seeing in the earth. Why all this is being stirred up. The enemy knows his time is so short. He's about done. Verse 13. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Notice, even after Jesus came... He's persecuting the woman. He's attacking this woman. We need to understand this. This woman is being persecuted and attacked by Satan and all of his demonic forces. And he's deceiving the whole world to try to do the same thing, to persecute and attack this woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and a half a time. Does that sound like a year and two more years and another half a year? Yeah, this is all talking about the end times. Now watch this. Verse 15, so the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, but that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman. And somehow here's the nation of Israel still in existence. Somehow after all of this. And uh, because the enemy's trying this and that and the other thing. Verse 17. Now, this is the last verse. Watch this. And the dragon was enraged. Do you see the language? The dragon was enraged with the woman. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. Wait a minute. So she already had one child. 
That's the Messiah. But notice, he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. Well, who are the rest of her offspring? Well, it says it right here. Who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Satan is enraged against the woman of this Jewish nation of Israel and wants to destroy it. And he also wants to destroy her offspring. First, Jesus himself. And second, everyone who believes in him. We are at war. This is playing out right before our very eyes. You are in this play, whether you realize it or not. And if you don't wake up and stop listening to all the rhetoric that's going around with these perspectives that come from often pure hearts and real suffering scenarios that we need to have mercy toward. Can you say amen? Amen. Because God loves these people. We have to be sensitive. We have people in our own congregation here that have family members in Gaza. That's real. That's real. And God loves them, and we need to pray for them. Pray for their protection. I just saw from Joel Rosenberg this morning, there are, from what we estimate, a thousand believers in Jesus that live in Gaza. And they're in the middle of this war. They're caught in the crosshairs. And these are our brothers and sisters. It's easy on, on this side of the planet to just give our opinions like armchair quarterbacks about what's going on over there. But when you're over there and you're in the middle of it, it's different. We have many friends uh, that have, I'll read to you if I have time, of families of hostages right now. Can you imagine what that's like? There are believers involved in this too, but even if they're not believers in Jesus yet, these are human beings, and this is real, and they're caught in this war with the the dragon called Satan who hates this nation and hates everyone like us. We're in the same category to him as the nation of Israel. We are in the same category to him, and God has made a covenant with them, Israel, to defend them, and God has made a covenant with us to defend us. We need to understand where we stand. We need to understand. We need to be sensitive to everybody, pray for everybody, love everybody, know that God is for everybody. But we need to understand what side of this war we are on spiritually, not politically. I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about spiritual things. Can you see? Okay, now. Who are the rest of the offspring? It's us, believers in Jesus, the church. Listen to Galatians 3.29. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We are in this. Jesus is Jewish. He's a Jewish Messiah to the world, a Savior to the world. And if you're in Christ, you also are spiritually Jewish. You're in this covenant with him. And you have to know this is real and it's happening And there's so much going on. No, we don't agree with everything that the government of Israel does. Of course not. No, but we have to understand the underlying premise is that God is bringing a plan of salvation to pass for the world. And he chose to use this land and this nation to do it. And we can't act like it's up for negotiation. It is not up for negotiation. This is God's plan. And we have to start from that premise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. If we can start with that premise, now we can talk about how we help everybody. But we have to start with the truth and reality that God didn't do this to hurt people. God did this to save the entire world. Can you see it? All right, now watch this. I want to talk a little more about the woman. Genesis 13, 14. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift your eyes now. He was, now he's in the land. Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants. What's the next word? Forever. Forever. What gives God the right to give it to them? When Abraham got to this land, there were people in the land. It's occupied. It's full of people. What gives God the right to do it? Why does God think that he can just say, I'm giving you this land? 
Here's, here's why. He is the creator. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and all of its fullness. The world and those who dwell therein. We all belong to God. He is the creator. We are his creation. And so God has no problem with saying, Look, I want to give this land to this family and make a nation out of them through which I will bring salvation to everyone. He has every right to give that land. And he gave it to them forever. Genesis 15, 4. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir. In fact, let's just jump to verse 5. Then God brought Abraham outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said, So shall your descendants be. Remember, he's married to a barren wife. And God said, Count the stars. That's how many children you're going to have. So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So that's a good thing. But notice in verse 7, Then God said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. Notice God keeps bringing up the land. The land is major to God. I'm giving you this land. I brought you here to give you this land that you would inherit it. Verse 8, And Abram said to, to God, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit? I'm looking at all these people. They're, it's already full of people. This is their home. This is where they live. How are you giving it to me? How am I going to know that? And look at this. So God said to him in verse 9, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, and a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And Abraham knew exactly what God meant. And Abraham brought all these, cut them in two down the middle, and placed each piece opposite. Abraham knew exactly what, what God was saying. I will make a blood covenant with you and swear to you that I will give this land. The covenant was not that what God would do it. God made a promise. He was going to do it. The covenant was to convince Abraham. And once he made a covenant, Abraham knew, now I know you'll do it because nobody breaks blood covenants. They die if they break blood covenants. And so the story goes on to say, I won't take time to read it, but Abraham cuts these animals. He lays them apart. All the blood falls in the middle. And normally what happens is two people come, they'll, they'll make their vows to one another of the covenant, they'll cut their wrists, they'll mix their blood together, they'll walk in the walk of blood, and I mean this, this blood is now up to their ankles or higher, you never forget you made a blood covenant. You, the smell of the animals and such, but in this case it was different. In this case God put Abraham to sleep, and the Bible says... In, in a dream, he could see that there was something of a smoking oven and a burning torch that came between those pieces. It was God himself. God did the walk of blood himself. But they didn't cut wrists and mix the blood. Now, why? Two reasons. Number one, this man Abraham is a sinner, like everybody else before they're saved by Jesus. Isn't that right? He has sinful blood. God can't mix with sinful blood. Second, God has no blood yet. So God has to do it this way for now. But how many of you know, about 2,000 years in the future, God becomes a human being, and he gets blood, and he resists every temptation to sin. And by the time Jesus gets to the cross, he's there as fully man and fully God, with innocent blood. And when he was crucified, how many wrists were cut? Two wrists were cut. And that day, the innocent blood of a human being and the blood of God himself flowed together. And Jesus said, I swear, I will never break this promise. And that includes for this nation and this land. And the entire world who wants to come over to this truth and receive the salvation that comes through this woman and this Savior. Can you see it? Yes. This is what we're talking about. This is the plan. And so that day, the blood of God and the blood of man flowed together. And by the way, the walk of blood, his feet were cut too. It's all there. It's all present. God is all in 
on this. So look at this. Verse 18, Genesis 15, 18. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, Perizzites, Rephaim, Amorites, Canaanites, you know, I mean, all of them, termites and everybody. Okay. <laughs> And look at, look at verse 7, uh, chapter 17, verse 7. God says, And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I will give to you, uh, I will give to your descendants after you the land. Notice God keeps bringing up the land, the land. I will give you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession. This is what he swore. I will do this, and I will be their God. You're going to be in this land, and there may be nations all around you that serve other gods, but in this land, you're going to live there. I'm giving it to you as an everlasting possession, and I'm going to be your God. In fact, one day this child is going to come back and rule the nations. Isn't that what Revelation 12 said? From that land. This land has an everlasting purpose. Okay, now watch this. Joel chapter 3, verse 2. I will also gather all nations. This is the, at the end of the age. This is the, the gathering of the nations with the sheep and the goats that Jesus talked about. I will also gather all nations. All nations. How many nations? All of them. And bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. This is in the land of Israel. And I will enter into judgment with them there. Watch these words. On account of my people, my heritage, Israel. I'm not just judging you to see whether you obeyed, whether you believed in Jesus or not. Yes, that's a part of it. I want to judge you on how you treated my covenant people. Because I said I will bless those who bless them. And I will curse him who curses them. And this is coming. This is coming. And no nation will be left out. How many of you can see this? See, we need to know who we are, and we need to know where we stand and how this thing is going to end. It's not going to end well for those who turn against the woman like the dragon and align with the dragon. It's not going to end well. And there's so many political things being spoken, and there are real issues to be discussed and to be resolved. It's not that God doesn't care about those two. But there's an underlying scenario that's happening. And if we don't know that scenario, we'll be caught up in the modern day conversations and, and align ourselves against God and with the dragon. Can you see this? Now, so I will gather all nations and bring them down and I'll enter into judgment there on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they scattered among the nations. This is what happened. You remember uh, they were scattered among the nations. Now they're coming back. But watch this, this last phrase. They have also divided up my land. They have also divided up my land. How many of you can see? God is not happy about that. And there's judgment that's going to happen for that. Now I want to put up a map of Israel. Let's put this up here. Let me see if I can get up. Well, I'm getting out of their way and in your way. I'm sorry about that. But um, now here's this yellow sliver of Israel, this nation here. And notice here this, this division here. This is the West Bank. It's on the West Bank of the River Jordan. This is the Gaza Strip. So these are divided from the land of Israel. Okay. And notice the River Jordan here. It flows all the way from the top of the map, way up in... Uh, the ancient city of Dan and Banyas, which is Caesarea Philippi. There are three tributaries that, that feed into the northern river Jordan, into the Sea of Galilee, and then out of the Sea of Galilee, into the Dead Sea down here. And then here's the Mediterranean Sea. How many of you have heard the rhetoric recently, from the river to the sea? This is, this is what it's talking about. From the river to the sea. And what is this, what is this saying? From the river to the sea... We want the Jews out. We want the nation of Israel out. It just so happens that from the river to the sea is the very land that God swore 
that he will never give up. That's my land. And not only that, he doesn't want it to be divided up through political solutions, like even including two state solutions. He doesn't want it to be divided up because he's working on a plan. And, and God says, I made this covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants to give them this land. And if I break my covenant with them, what is my message to the world? You cannot trust me to keep my promises. I must keep my covenant and promises to this nation to show the world I am who I say I am. And it will be exactly as I say. And you can trust that. So if I say you can be forgiven from your sins through Jesus and come into my family and have eternal life, you can count on it. I will never change my mind. But you have to come. Can anybody see this? This is what God is doing. He must keep to the plan. He cannot lie. He cannot lie. Now, let me, let me say this too, that, well, we have a problem. Well, what about all these people? What about all these other people, the Palestinians? That, does God love them? Yes. Does God want to solve all of their problems? Yes. If, especially if they turn to Jesus, will God answer their prayers and do miracles for them? Yes. So we can't be just strong and just be oh, all about Israel and forget those other people. Well, God doesn't forget those other people. God loves everybody. He loves everybody. He wants to solve all the problems. But he has to solve them in a way to keep his covenants. Now, let me put up this, this second map. I want you to see this. Let me point out Israel. This green sliver here, this is Israel. And all of the yellow nations, these are the Arab nations. Palestinians are primarily Arab. These are the Arab nations. I want you to see how many nations and the land mass that they have available to them and the land that the Jews have available to them. And that land, by the way, is divided up. Much of that green sliver is divided up in the West Bank uh, under the rule of the Palestinian Authority and under Gaza. Are you seeing this? Okay, so to say, well, there's not enough land. That's the problem. We need from the river to the sea. We need this little sliver because then we'll have enough land for the people. There are other solutions here that, that nations have not been willing to, to consider because that doesn't help the overall cause. Because the overall cause, the underlying cause, is that there is a dragon named Satan who is trying to destroy this woman. And that's why no matter how small this land is, it's too much. You get none of it. Why? Because it's the plan of God. That's why. Can anybody see this? Let me show you one more map. This is a map. All the green nations on this map are the Muslim nation because uh, in large part, uh, Muslims have, uh, have taken up this cause. But not every Muslim, of course. And how many of you know that not all Muslims are terrorists? Isn't that right? There's so many good people that... that have morality and they're not in favor of this. In fact, I just heard the news, uh, the, the leader of Bahrain just came out and condemned unequivocally the terrorist attack October the 7th and Hamas. And so we just need to know, don't, don't overgeneralize things. God loves all these people, but you just need to see 66 Muslim nations. And here, here's, here's Israel. And so don't believe, well, that's the problem. That's the problem. They have too much land. That's the, that's, that's the problem. This is if we could just solve this problem. The underlying issue is spiritual. Can you see this? God is after all these people, all these nations. He loves them. And right now, the heart of God is to save every one of them, to show the love of Jesus to every one of them. Okay, so we want to close here. Oh, boy, look at the time. Wow. Boy. Okay, so let's do this. We want to pray. We want to pray. The Bible says pray for everybody. We're going to pray for everybody. But we also want to pray for this woman whom the great dragon Satan is trying to destroy even now. And we want to pray that these hostages be released. 
And we want to pray that God will use this horrific situation called war to save as many people as possible on all sides of the issue. Can you say amen to that? See, we're in favor of everybody. We're pro-everybody to be saved. We stand with the covenants of God. And then from that place of standing with the covenants of God, we pray for everybody, Lord. Even deceived people who have been antagonistic, they can change. When the gospel comes into their hearts, they can change. Amen? Let's stand together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we come right now in the name of Jesus. Let's begin to mutter in prayer together. Lord, we bring up this whole situation to you. We see this war that's going on in the heavenlies between Satan and his demonic forces and the woman, the Jewish nation of Israel. And not only against Israel, but also against all who believe in the child Jesus. And that's us. Lord, we see this going on and we will not comply with him. We will not align with him and his wicked plans to destroy this nation that you began to bring salvation to the world. We will not align with him. We will not chant his rhetoric. We will not do it. We will not do it. We will align with you, oh God. And now, Lord, we pray that you would bring peace to Jerusalem and Israel in Jesus' name. Show the world that you keep your covenant, O God, by bringing peace and protection to them in the name of Jesus. And, Lord, we pray for the hostages to be released. Oh, Lord, release them. Release them. Those that are still alive, release them. Those who have been killed, Lord, Have their bodies be recovered for those families in the name of Jesus. We speak blessing to your people, Lord. We speak blessing. You chose this people. And Lord, whether we agree with everything they do or not is not the point. The point is that we bless them because you bless them. You chose them and used them. And so we bless them and we pray for the release of these hostages in Jesus' name. And Lord, at the same time, we also pray for all who are involved with this war, whether they be on the Israeli side or the Palestinian side in Gaza, Lord, protect all innocent people, Lord. Protect the innocent people, people, families who are just caught in harm's way, Lord, children and such. Lord, cause miracles to happen to bring protection. In the name of Jesus, bring protection. Lord, we pray that you would use this whole scenario to bring people to Jesus. Oh, Lord, bring people to Jesus. May the love of God be evident to people. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for it. We thank you for it. We bless you. Lord, we pray for believers around the world that their spiritual eyes would be open so that they would not be caught up in the deception of the dragon. In the name of Jesus. And that we would align ourselves with the truth of the word. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We bless you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Jesus said, if two of us would agree on earth concerning anything that we ask, Father would do it for us. How many of you would say amen and clap your hands in agreement today? Amen.